When Paul had made his plans to visit Macedonia and Achaia 12 months earlier, he had envisaged moving on from there to return to Jerusalem. And this was an opportunity to bring a gift to the churches of Jerusalem. And so he had mentioned to the churches of Macedonia and Archaia the need of the believers in Judea. Had the Christians had responded with a desire to contribute to sending relief to Judea. Now the time was coming for Paul to actually make the journey to Judea. Twelve months had passed and the Corinthians had been part of that promise. So as he writes Second Corinthians, he reminds them of their promise and compares their zeal with that of the Macedonian churches who were also contributing. And he uses their example that they had given themselves first to God, that they had given willingly and voluntarily according to their ability, indeed beyond their ability. They were not just sending spare change, but they had a genuine care for their fellow believers who were suffering in Judea. And that this Christian giving was in fact an outworking of what it means to be a Christian. Because Christ, because of his concern for us, despite his comfort and ease in heaven, made himself poor that we might become rich in him because of his love for us. And so Christian giving is not just a means of getting merit from God by giving, but rather it is God's way of passing blessings from one person to another. And if we have the mind of Christ, giving will be a key part of our thinking. But our giving will always be because of our concern for those who receive the gift. So he continues in Second Corinthians chapter 9. Now concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know your willingness, about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, that Archaia was ready a year ago and your zeal has stirred up the majority. Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that, as I said, you may be ready, lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, should be ashamed of this confident boasting. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time, and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity, and not as a grudging obligation. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, He has dispersed abroad, He has given to the poor, His righteousness endures forever. Now may He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food Supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality which causes thanksgiving through us to God for the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God while through the proof of this ministry They glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. And by their prayer for you, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. My name's Arthur and I thank you for joining me as we consider this really important subject of Christian giving. In the Old Testament, there was a system of tithes. It was a national system. So the tithe was like a tax that supported the 
administration, the priests. So, to be fair, it was levied at 10%. It would be great if our tax system just sat at 10% to provide for the administration of our nation. Of course, there was always the opportunity for people to give more than the 10% because it is in the character of God to give. So when we come to the New Testament, there is never any exhortation as to the proportion of our income that we must give. Rather, Christian giving is seen as a response of the Christian's heart. It is an outworking of the gospel according to what a person is willing to give, their ability to give. When the Lord changes our heart, our attitude to money, time and effort and priorities changes. As he said earlier in chapter 5 of Second Corinthians, a person who is in Christ is a new creature. And so we're not concerned about amassing material things on this earth, but rather we are concerned about people and the well-being of people. And so the Corinthians, when they heard of the need of the churches in Judea, had responded 12 months earlier and said, yes, we'll be part of that. And their readiness to be part of that had stimulated Paul as he went and spoke to the churches of Macedonia. Now it was time for them to actually deliver on their promise. And so that they would not be caught out, so things are done decently in order, he has sent Titus back to the church in Corinth with men from the other churches, that they organise the gift, so that as he passes through, that they might all proceed together to Jerusalem with this gift, and that there wouldn't be a mad scramble and an embarrassment because they had made the promise, but because there had been a delay in the delivering of that promise, they had redirected their funds somewhere else. The key principle that Paul announces is he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now we need to understand that we are sowing into the lives of people and so we are bringing blessing to people so that they can produce in due course. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. It's up to me to decide what to do with the things that the God has put in my hand and whether I become a channel of blessing to others or whether I keep things to myself. The Lord was very critical of a man whose land produced great produce and so his determination was to build bigger barns and then to live at ease. That is not the reason that God gives us things but rather that we might pass them on. It is our choice, our decision. It is the working out of God's Spirit in our lives that prompts these things. So it's not grudging, it's not of necessity, it's not a tax that's set by somebody else. It's something that we work out before God. And nobody should criticise us for giving too much or too little. In fact, the principle that the Lord Jesus enunciated in the Sermon on the Mount was that we should give secretly so that we don't look for credit now for what we give. Many corporations, when they give, like to receive a public acknowledgement. It puts their name forward. But God loves a cheerful giver, who gives not to gain credit for themselves, but because of their concern for the cause that they are supporting. This attitude of giving is discussed in Galatians. As ye sow, so shall ye reap, he said there. And in Philippians chapter 4, the Philippian church had given to support Paul out of their great poverty. And he responds by saying, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So when we give to God, we can trust God to continue to meet our needs. For he says, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food Supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. The ultimate outcome is God is praised and people are helped. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift.